Good morning, RBC. I want to encourage you to hold your place there in Psalm 89. As you know, we've been walking through since the beginning of this year, we've been walking through 1 Corinthians and we've taken breaks here and there, particularly lately. And we're going to break once more uh, over the next few weeks and we plan to come back to 1 Corinthians and begin to look at the Lord's Supper in chapter 11 after the first of the year. But first I want us to begin to walk through Psalm 89. I absolutely love the Psalms. I love you. This is going to be an explosive combination. I have to take at least a few weeks of the year and just walk through a Psalm or a few Psalms. And this one we plan to do in multiple parts. Steve Lawson writes that in contrast to the unfaithfulness of man, God shows himself to be forever faithful to his people especially in keeping his promises. How soul-strengthening it is to behold one who keeps his word at all times. God always stands committed to do what he says he will do. He will never forget his word. He will never forfeit his promises. And he never violates his covenant. Never does he pledge something and then fail to bring it to pass. Never does he speak and fail to fulfill it. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. God is a faithful God. Friends, in a world where we see left and right marriage covenants shattered, where we see business promises that are broken, where we see churches that fail to hold to the truth, where we see politicians who rarely uphold their marching orders, I love the way A.W. Pink puts this psalm in summary. How blessed to lift our eyes above this scene of ruin and behold one who is faithful in all things and at all times. The title of this sermon is Christmas, the King is Coming. We're going to see how as we live on the brink of ruin, we are anticipating the rebuilding of those ruins which have been tarnished by sin as we look for redemption to come through our coming King. I want to very quickly give you an outline of this psalm, which will serve as a roadmap to guide us through this adventure. Look with me at Psalm 89, verses 1 through 18. In the first scene of this psalm, which we plan to look at this morning, we see a call to praise the King who rules to praise the king who rules. And we see our king is faithful and mighty. It's a Christmas praise. If you continue to glance and look at verses 19 through 37, you will see a scene shift. And in that scene, next Sunday, we plan to not only praise the king who rules, but we begin to anticipate the king to be revealed. And in that section of this psalm, we see a covenant and we will see a throne and we will see a Christmas promise. And then finally, in verses 38 through 52, this psalm ends with a call on the king to restore, where we see sin and salvation and we see a a Christmas lament. We'll begin at the first opening verses of Psalm 89. But before we do, you have to understand that there are different types of psalms. And this psalm, 89, is multifaceted. We see elements in this psalm of a communal lament where God's people are coming together to grieve over the conditions of life in a fallen world. We see flavors of a royal psalm where a royal king is pointed to. Ultimately, that would be Christ. We see flavors of a hymn of praise where God is praised from the rooftops through all creation. And we see elements of a covenant psalm where at the center of this psalm is the covenant that we'll begin to look at this morning. As you understand the flow of this psalm, you realize that we begin with praise to God from heaven and all of earth. We'll continue to make our way through this psalm as we see the promise of a Davidic dynasty, a dynasty that will never decay. We see the true heir of this dynasty, this Christ King, who is the fulfillment of the offspring of David. And he's coming to save and to bless a people for himself. 
But what we see as we begin with praise to God and the promise of a king is we begin unlike many of the Psalms. Many Psalms will begin with lament and then they'll end with praise. This Psalm, however, is different. It it begins with praise and it ends with lament. It's as if the psalmist is praising God, lifting his, his gaze to heaven. He's anticipating that Davidic king, Jesus Christ, to come. But then his gaze lowers to the surroundings that are all around him. And he's recognizing the brokenness of life in the fallen world around us. And he's saying, Lord, you are this and you have promised this. But when I look around, I see the complete opposite. I see this. Lord, how can we reconcile who you are and what you were promised and and your kingship over all things that everything submits to you? But when we look around in a fallen world, it just doesn't look like it. And so the psalmist is confronted with the heaviness of grief and lament. By the end of this psalm, the thing that I love about this psalm is it's exactly like life. Some believe that this psalm is just a patchwork of a lot of different pieces from ancient literature that have been sewn together a little bit awkwardly. I believe that this is one whole psalm intended from the beginning of its conception exactly like God put it. It's intended to reflect reality. It's intended to reflect reality. As we look around and we realize that life does not always end like a Hallmark movie, does it? It just doesn't end with a bow. And and in this psalm, we see the jagged edges of reality where the psalmist refuses to pull it together with a bow where everything just turns out peachy. It might not end with a bow, but it does end with a blessing. In verse 52, amidst the perplexing and painful realities of such life in a fallen world, we aren't given a resolution to the tension. And that's life, isn't it? You see, in real life, fairy tales fade. In real life, the easy stories with happy endings always collide with doses of reality. And for Psalm 89, that reality looks like this. The king's crown is going to be thrown into the mud. His kingdom is going to be tattered and then plundered and then humiliated and then reduced to ruins. And the sword is going to be turned against the king and his glory will be turned to shame. And so the psalmist will end just as he begins. Look with me in verse 1. At the very beginning, he proclaims the steadfast love of the Lord. When he looks around at the brokenness of sin within himself and within the world, he concludes in verse 49. He's still proclaiming the steadfast love of the Lord. Whether it rains on his parade or not, the steadfast love of the Lord and his faithfulness is steady. So this crisis of faith arises amidst a bleak spiritual desert of the heart. But hope throughout all of that prevails in Christ. I want you to notice one more important point about this psalm. Did you know that the psalms are broken up into five different books? Five different books comprise the Psalter. The Hebrews would have sung this as a central part of their worship. As you put your your finger in Psalm 89, you're coming to the last psalm in the fourth of five books. And in these psalms, we see the aspirations of a royal savior continue to dim. We see divine hope, but only in glimpses until we reach book five where they all come to fruition. Look with me at the title of the psalm. Have you ever noticed as you read the psalms that there's often a title that gives us a little bit of background? But it's usually not helpful because you think a mascal of Ethan the Ezraite. That clears everything up, doesn't it? (laughs) What in the world is going on here? Ethan the Ezraite seems to have been a Levite. 
from the priestly class of Israel in 1 Chronicles 15, 7 through 19. He's mentioned again in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31, when Solomon's wisdom is described, and Ethan comes to mind as someone who is so exceedingly wise. Listen, this dude was sharp. With God-given wisdom. But First Kings says, but even he, when compared to Solomon, could not measure up to such tremendous wisdom. Ethan in this psalm is praising God. He's anticipating God's promise of an anointed ruler. He's lamenting the reality of life under the broken covenant of God. He's interceding for God to help his people amidst their defeat and their distress. We don't know the context. We don't know for sure the background. What was going on when this psalm was written? How did Israel use it in their worship? We just simply don't know. What we do know is that it looks back on the time of David, and it looks forward to a greater David. A greater David. It's a mesquil, which is a heading used in 13 Psalms. Most likely just, just simply means something which instructs. It's didactic. There is something here that's being taught that the reader needs to understand. And what is being taught here is the instruction that we need about trusting God in tough times. When the soul is stabbed with grief, when the soul wrestles with unbelief, when you say that Christ is king and nothing in this world looks like it as you look around. Spurgeon said that no subject unlocks all of theology like being instructed in the covenant of God. And at the heart of this psalm is God's covenant, the covenant of grace, distinguishing the covenants of work and grace and being well instructed in the things of the kingdom. I want you to notice in this psalm the poetic parallelism. You cannot just read this psalm like you would any other literature. He piles one phrase upon another, and each succeeding phrase is coupled with the one before it, and it completes it. It further expresses it. And as you go through this psalm, you realize that reading Psalm 89 is like scaling Mount Everest. Look with me in verse 1. You'll see how we're immediately taken up to heaven. We get this breathtaking view of the glorious praise of God. We open with this declaration in verse 1 of God's eternal love and His faithfulness. His mighty wonders, His rightful rule. And it's demonstrated through God's exploits where He conquers enemies throughout the earth. We're taken up into the courts and the council of heaven. We receive the oracle of God of this coming covenant king in verses 6 through 18. And the anticipation continues to mount. There must be a king who will come and do what all other kings have failed to do, which is to rightly represent the one true king and his rule. That king from the line of David, which would have referred to the united kingdom of Israel under David and Solomon. And then after the splitting of the kingdom, the kingdom would refer to Judah from that line from which the king would come. And this distress continues to mount as sin increases and a resolution must be displayed. You ask, where is God's faithfulness in all of this? The psalmist answers, great is thy faithfulness with no shadow of turning with thee. I believe that we need to remember in our cultural moment who the king is. I believe that we tend to think that maybe the president is the king or maybe modern medicine is the king or maybe you and I, maybe we are the kings. This psalm puts us in our proper place. It looked unhopeful just as it does to us 
to those who have, would have read this psalm for the first time. It looked unhopeful to Adam when he was cast out of the garden. It looked unhopeful to Sarah who tried another way when God's plan seemed slack. It looked unhopeful to Israel when they were in Egypt and then in Babylon and other foreign lands. God, I thought you were faithful. I thought you were good to your people. And one ruler after another raised up to do what Adam failed to do, to finish what David started to do. And a babe was born in a manger, and a king put a price on his head because it threatened his own kingship. And what we see throughout the Bible time and time again, from Genesis to Revelation, is that the success of Satan only sets up the victory of God. Amen. Only sets up the victory of God. So this, rule, this king is coming. He's ruling and he's going to restore what has been ruined. I want you to notice in verses 1 through 4, number 1, we will see the praise of God below. The praise of God below. We'll see steadfast love and generational faithfulness. Number two, we will see the praise of God from above. And from above, we will look down on the earth and see mighty wonders and cosmic com comparisons in verses 5 through 8. In verses 9 through 14, we see the praise of God abroad. We'll see conquering exploits and we'll see universal ownership over all things. And then we'll finish this morning, Lord willing, number four, in verses 15 through 18, with the blessing of God on the people of God. And next week, we'll continue to look at the terms of this covenant and what that's all about. Notice with me, number one, even in the midst of a national disaster, he begins with the praise of God from below. The praise of God from below. In verse 1, the declaration is, I will sing. He can't help but sing. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, or for I say, steadfast love will be built up forever. And the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. We find the word forever eight times in this psalm. You know what that means? It ain't gonna end. We see the word faithfulness seven times. The word covenant is used three times. Seven times we see the words steadfast love, the covenant-keeping love of God for his people. We see this steadfast love appear in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You have to be thankful for that. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty? And he says that this is to the third and the fourth generation. The forever of this singing of God's love and his faithfulness, as we've said, will be coupled in verse 38 with the question, God, how long? How long until you demonstrate this love and faithfulness? And it will seem that God has forsaken his promise. So the Psalmist sings of the loving kindness of God. It's a settled matter for him. What about you? Is the steadfast love and faithfulness of God a settled matter for you? I never forget, I believe it was Spurgeon who put it, you never question in the darkness what you know is truth in the light. You never question in the darkness what you know is truth in the light. Is the steadfast love and faithfulness of God a settled matter for you? It is in heaven. And it is for you, whether you realize it or not, even when you're going through a dark tunnel. Amen. 
It says built up. It will lead to the display of God's steadfast love and building the house of David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It'll be displayed stone by stone as God's steadfast love is erected into an edifice that will be completed. Isaiah 55, 3 says, Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. The apostles came onto the scene in Acts chapter 13, verse 34, and they were proclaiming the sure mercies of David in Jesus Christ. It's an emphatic declaration that God's faithfulness is registered and firmly fixed in the heavens. Calvin said that it's a promise no less stable than the heavens itself. It's the place to which we run in times of trouble. When you cannot bank on anything else because everything in life seems unstable and untrustworthy, you can settle the fact that the steadfast love of God is an anchor for your soul. We're apt to forget that. Look with me in verse 3. The psalmist says, I will sing. But the only reason he will sing is because what God has said. You know, during COVID, they tried to shut us up and they tried to tell us that we can't sing. You can't even sing if you're at home behind a computer by yourself locked up in a room. I'm going to sing. <laughs> because we have something to sing about. Amen. Now, if God hasn't said anything to you and you're a part of the world, it would not be surprising to me that you don't have anything to sing about. Amen. Your lips are sealed because you have nothing to say. But when God makes a promise and God says something, it gives you something to sing about. You have said what? What has God said? He has said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I'm in control of all of human history. And you remember that the apparent success of Satan every time is only setting up the future victory of God. I have sworn to, my, to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Selah. We have a poetic exposition of 2 Samuel 7. David promises to build a material house for God. But God in turn promises to make a dynasty from David through his physical line. What you have to understand in the first century context and previously all the way back to the writing of the Psalms is that the king was viewed in the eyes of the people as a divine representative on earth. He was not God or a God in himself among believers, although he was among the heathen. But he was seen among God's people to be subject to God, to represent his rule and to be summoned by the rule of God through the consent of God's people to exercise his authority on behalf of the Lord so that the people flourish under the exercise of the law of God. The king was seen, such as in Psalms 2, as a son of God. There was a father-like son relationship between the God and the king. This is reflected very early in Genesis with Adam, who was a sort of king ruling over the garden intended to reflect his father. This king did not have a direct authority, an absolute authority, like only God has. But the king did have a derived and a limited authority from God. Look with me if you will turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. We plan to revisit this in the second part of Psalm 89 
with more detail. But suffice to say, this covenant, this chosen one, this servant David, this offspring and throne talk from Psalm 89.3, it comes directly from what Nathan told David in 2 Samuel 7. Look with me in verse 12. I will raise up your offspring after you who will come from your body, a little son, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And verse 15 uses the same phrase, that we've already seen in Psalm 89. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. A covenant's been made. An oath or a promise. And the way that this would ordinarily take place, particularly going back to the early chapters of Genesis with Abraham, they actually would not make a covenant so much as they would cut a covenant. An animal would be split into two halves. The parties entering into the agreement would walk between the two halves of the animal which has been split. And the declaration would be, if I don't hold up my end of this covenant, may I be as the animal. Boy, if we practice that today, that would change a few promises that are made, wouldn't it? Though there are conditions that must be met to this covenant, ultimately, this covenant is unconditional because God's going to see it through. A kingdom will be established forever. A king is surely coming. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 17, he writes, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. 1 Kings 8, 16 says that God chose no house for his own. But he did choose David to build a house to serve his people. In Psalm 132, 11, it was a sure oath to reserve the throne for his sons. In Isaiah 42, verse 1, we read that, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Is our world messed up today around the idea of justice? Executing justice. We can't even execute justice because we don't even understand what justice is anymore. All of human history hangs on whoever this son is. And God will rule and preserve his people through the sons of David forever. From those sons would come the son. And he would have a rule that would not be rivaled. And his rule would be displayed in a way that would never be imagined. Who is this king? Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And among his many names, he will be called Mighty God. Who is this servant? Who is this son of David? In Galatians chapter 3, Paul would clarify that it's actually not seeds. It's rather seed. This is all pointing to one offspring, one man, one God-man. Look with me in Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we see the fulfillment of this language echoed in Psalm 89, which is pulled from 2 Samuel 7, which is fulfilled in Luke chapter 1. The Bible says, kiss the son lest he be angry. Who is the son? In Luke chapter 1 verse 30, we read that she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Here we go. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father who? David. 
the throne of his father, David. You ever look around at your life, particularly in times of difficulty and frustration, and you think, is God doing anything? And then you walk through that season to the other side, looking back, and you realize that hindsight is 2020. And you realize that actually God is doing 10,000 things in your life at any given moment, and you might be aware of three of them. And you realize that God has been in charge the entire time, providentially orchestrating every detail of the entire story. He has never taken his hands off the wheel. Jesus take the wheel. He never took his hands off the wheel. And he'll display kingship over all things. Have you noticed today in our world as well that you can talk about any religion? It seems that in the public square you can mention any other so-called God or any other so-called religious tradition. But as soon as we start talking about Jesus and a manger scene, it's got to go. We can tolerate any religion but this one. Did you know that that's as old as the birth of Jesus? There was a king that heard about this king, and even from the very beginning, he felt that his kingship was threatened, so he wanted to kill whoever this coming king was. Psalm 89.4 brings us to a transition point. Look with me at the end of verse 1. We have the word Selah. Selah. We don't really know what this word means for sure, but it seems to indicate a lifting up. This would have been such a strong statement that either the music would have been lifted up and screaming to a climax or the music could have come to a stop as they were singing this song in such a way as to say, before we go anywhere else, let's stop and let's be quiet and think about that. Meditate on the truth that has just been given. And then we move to number two, the praise of God above. Look with me in verse five. At mighty wonders and cosmic comparisons. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Look at the questions. For who in the skies can compare to the Lord? Who among the holy beings is like the Lord? What's the answer to that? No one. A, great, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. I love the way that James Montgomery Boyce notes he said, isn't it interesting to think that the angels are praising God in heaven for the very characteristic that we are most tempted to question from below? Is this not a rebuke to our faith? If we thought like the angels think, then we would be praising God for his great faithfulness constantly. For his wonders, which are his astonishing feats throughout the earth. We'll see an example of that in a few moments. For his faithfulness, which means his dependable word. His dependable word. And so we've moved from the ground beneath to the heavenly choir above. In verse 5, look with me in your Bible, to the assembly of the holy ones. We move in verse 6 to his heavenly beings, or it could read his sons. We move in verse 7 to the council of the holy ones around him. The holy ones. That's cute, isn't it? Sweet little angels floating around in the sky. What a precious sight. 
until you read Deuteronomy 33 verse 2, which says that he came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. That's not very cute, is it? Until you read Daniel 7.10, which says a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands. Any mathematicians here? A thousand thousands served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him and the court sat in judgment. The question is often asked, are we alone in the universe? What do you think? Are we alone in the universe? We are not alone in the universe. <laughs> Consider the heavenly host of 10,000 times 10,000s. In Psalm 103, verse 20 and 21, we see that angels do the bidding of God. They're singing his praises. They're serving his people. They're inflicting his judgment on the earth. And they are astonished at the work of God's grace to save sinners, reconcile them together in what we call the church. And they scratch their heads at the thought of why and how God would do such a thing like that. We normally destroy our enemies. We don't normally die for and save our enemies. We see the cosmic choir praising all the perfections of God. In Judges chapter 3, verse 22, we have a scene where people are seeing angels and they fear for their lives. I saw an angel this week. Did you fear for your life and think that you had seen God himself? What an unbelievable sight. It doesn't compare unless that's God. Verse 8, look with me. He's the Lord of hosts. Every time this phrase is used, it refers to the picture of the Lord as a mighty warrior. Picture this. And he is leading conquest on the earth with his heavenly army surrounding him, ensuring that victory is sure. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 7. Speaking of the view from above, the angels who know and see everything Occurring. What's on their mind? What's on their mind? Revelation chapter 7 verse 10 tells us what's in the mind of those before the throne. And here's what's on their mind. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what's on their mind. Look at me. The things that you're in your mind right now. I wish I could read your mind. No, I don't. No, I don't. The things that are on your mind right now, will it, matter in, will it matter in a year? Will it matter in a thousand years? What's on your mind right now? Seriously, look at me. Will it matter in 10,000 years? What's going to matter in a year? What's going to matter in a thousand years? What's going to matter in 10,000 years? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God. Here we go. Forever. First Chronicles 29, 11 says that this is not new news. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and is in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. You are exalted as head above all. And the best thing that we could do right now is to tell the entire world that Jesus Christ is king and one day you're going to realize it. Come to him now. 
Well, you can come voluntarily and graciously. He summons you before his throne like a father does his son. You say, I'm going to wait. Don't wait. Because if you wait and it's too late, you will still be summoned before his throne, but he will shatter your kneecaps until you boldly, humbly bow before his throne involuntarily. But you will bow. All men will bow. And the world doesn't like that. We would rather a nice Jesus. Why can't I have a nice one? He just gives me what I want. It's not the true king over all the earth. And the Bible says in this passage that we are to give him utmost respect and utmost reverence. Friends, as you look around the world, don't forget who's in charge. Number three, the praise of God abroad. The praise of God abroad. As creator, God has a title deed to everything. He owns and rules all things. Look with me in verse 9. He's ruling the chaotic raging of nature. The seas are pictured as that which is ultimately unpredictable and untamed in the Psalms. But even Jesus Christ, when he was sitting on that boat asleep and everything went haywire, with a word, he calmed the unpredictable raging sea. Look with me at verse 10. We're introduced to someone. We're introduced to Rahab. Well, it's not who you may be thinking. Most likely, this is a nickname for Egypt. This is a conquest, an exploit. Throughout the Psalms in the Old Testament, we see connections between the sea and Egypt. And they're both referred to by this term, Rahab. Egypt is pictured in the Old Testament as a dragon in the sea, stirring up the raging waters. Let me ask you a question. Did anything happen in Egypt that pertained to a sea? The mighty Egypt who once enslaved God's people, a superpower, was slain in the Red Sea. The Bible says that God cut her in pieces, Isaiah 51, 9. In this passage, we see that God crushed Egypt like a corpse. This superpower who thought she could rule the world sat in a million pieces under the feet of God in a second. In verse 12, not only are we introduced to a nation, we're introduced to mountains. He mentions Tabor. Tabor is a lowly mountain in the southwest of Israel. It's about 1,900 feet. So from Tabor, this lowly mountain, all the way to the northeast, we're introduced, look in your Bibles, to Hermon, a majestic mountain of 9,000 feet. And if you can picture these two mountains framing the center of Egypt, where all uh, the center of Israel, where all of redemption is going to take place. And they are joyfully praising God. So let me, let me put it all in perspective for you. The idea is that from the north to the south, from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, from the angels in heaven to the men below, all of creation is bearing witness to the worth of God's praise. And you already know this because 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 98 verse 8 says that the rivers are clapping for joy. How dare you not clap in his presence when even the rivers clap before his throne? God's love is so vast that there is nothing anywhere that can separate us from it. It can't be contained. Look with me in verse 13. God's arm, it refers to his strength. His hand refers to his reach. God's right hand, mentioned in verse 13, refers to a high place of preeminent power. Power. 
So the word picture here is that on one hand, God's right hand is raised and it is ready to strike. It is raised and it is ready to strike just like he did in the Red Sea when he brought God's people out of Egypt. But on the other hand, Isaiah 59, 1 says that for those who humble themselves, his hand is not too short to save. And if you'll humble yourself before his mighty hand, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or what you did last night or where you've been this morning, his hand can find you. Verse 14. Look at the picture of God as he's displayed. He's governing the way that all lesser magistrates and rulers should govern. Listen up. Magistrates of Elmore County and Wetumpka and the state of Alabama and the United States. God governs as you should govern with righteousness and justice. The government of God is not tyrannical. The government of God conforms to what is holy and just and right. Oh, if you check out now, you're going to wish you wouldn't have. Look with me in verse 14. What ought we look for in representatives, in rulers? Steadfast love or mercy and faithfulness or it could be translated truth, go before you. Steadfast love and faithfulness are the fundamental motivations of God in everything that he does. Love and faithfulness mark out the path of all of God's works. These are the qualities upon which the divine order of God's throne rests. These are the royal attendants to his throne. I was reading about one emperor this week. His name was Emperor Trajan. Emperor Trajan had a throne. And as an emperor, he was once appointing a subordinate authority, handing out a throne of one who would rule under him as a lesser magistrate. And as he appointed that throne, he said these words, Use this sword against my enemies if I give righteous commands. But if I give unrighteous commands, use the sword against me. I think that we ought to put it in the presidential oath. Use this sword against all of our enemies. But if I give unrighteous commands with this sword, use it against me. Yes, sir. Why? Because Proverbs 16, 12 says that it is an abomination to kings to do evil. For the throne is established by righteousness. And ultimately, that throne is Jesus Christ. Let's conclude with number four with a blessing. The blessing of God on the people of God. Look with me in verse 15. You say, I know that God rules the nations. I know that God can do anything. But is he willing? And what about me? Is God willing to do anything on my behalf? We move from this declaration about who God is to this direct declaration about who the people of God are. Verse 15 says, blessed are the people. It's a benediction. It's a blessing on God's people. It refers to the state of well-being. It means for all who fear God, all is truly well. One scholar said that the subjects of God's rule thrive under his administration. Spurgeon said that for those who are in Christ, every attribute of God is a fountain of delight. Let's take a brief tour. Look in verse 15 
Where does our blessing, where does the state of our well-being lie? Here's what we know. In verse 15, we know the joy of God. We know the joy of God. Look in your Bible. Who know the festal shout. This is the loud praise of God before a worshiping community. We know that our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We know in verse 15 that we walk in the light of God. The text says, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face. 1 John 1 says that if we confess our sins, then we walk in fellowship with God and in one another and his favor rests on us. So we live continually in the intimate purity and the guidance of God. Verse 16, we live in the triumph of God. The saints are pictured as exulting or rejoicing with pleasure in God's name, in the very essence and the expression of who he is all the day. Friends, all day long, whether it rains on our parade or whether it shines, we can walk in the light of God's face and we can rejoice in his name all day long. The forecast is always bright in heaven. We can always be happy and satisfied in him. Why? Because for the holy ones, everything's well and everything's taken care of and there is nothing to worry about. Verse 16, we are exalted in the righteousness of God. And in your righteousness, the righteous rule of God, we're exalted. You see, sin grinds us down into the ground. But the righteousness of God imparted to us through Christ lifts us up into the heavens. And then finally, in verse 17, we move to a direct address to God himself. We see God's glory and our strength. He says, for you are the glory of their strength. Our strength is not in ourselves. And our strength is not to glorify ourselves. Our strength is found in Christ and our strength points to Christ. In verse 17, we see God's favor and our exaltation. He says, by your favor, our horn is exalted. It refers to being warmly welcomed before God, to resting in peaceful acceptance in Christ. It means that he's not insecure. His life is not unstable. The believer is pictured in verse 17 with a horn. And the idea behind a horn is one of strength. It's one of victory. It means that a Christian ought not ever walk around defeated because he's not. And then he closes this section in verse 18 by saying, For our shield belongs to the Lord. God's defending his people. The Lord will fight for us, he is our defense. Our king belongs to the Holy One, the Holy One of Israel. In other words, in defending, listen to this, in defending our defender, the king, God is defending us. Our king is to be a protector of the people, and our king is safest and he is ablest when he belongs to the king. And speaking of a king, the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks in question 26, how does Christ execute the office of a king? The answer, Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Christ came to be born sinless of a virgin. He lived a perfectly righteous life in the fulfillment of God's law.
Jesus died the death of sinners and he rose again from the dead to validate who he is and that God accepted his sacrifice. And he rules in session and he promises to return. Jesus Christ is the unrivaled, undisputed king. The question is, do you gladly receive him as your king? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the confidence that you're in charge of everything. We thank you for the reminder that you are more good to your people than we would ever dare to ask you to be. We thank you for the demonstration of your rule and your steadfast love and your faithfulness in Christ. Renew our faith. Give us faith today. Help us to live in the blessing that you've already pronounced on us and help us to sing to you and rejoice in you, not just today, but every day and all day long. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.